RPG overload <laughs> and doing my absolute best okay to basically finish up Baldur's Gate 3 and Like a Dragon Infinite Well the good news is we are on pace to finish these games this week doesn't this sound like a person whose hobby and passion is in video games? Everybody that I know that plays video games and enjoys them tells me constantly how bad they just want to beat a game and how they're not interested in playing them anymore. In fact, if we stay at the same pacing that we've been at, I'll probably beat them both on Friday. And I know that's crazy. Like, wait, what? It's going to be perfect timing to finish them both on Friday? Yeah, maybe. All right? But let me tell you guys something. All right? And again, you know me. I'm honest. I'm not a butt kisser, but I also don't irrationally hate things for clickbait views. I try to acknowledge when DSP is right, and in this instance, I think that DSP is right. He doesn't hate on things for clickbait views. That's not him. He does hate on things for his fragile ego, though. He goes out of his way to play contrarian all of the time because he thinks that it makes him look cool and makes him different. And he will find any little reason along the way to validate his opinion. Because obviously, his opinion is the right one. So you're right, DSP. You don't do it for clickbait views. Because that would almost be a good idea. It might make people talk about your channel. It might drive people to your channel to hear what you have to say since you are doing things for clickbait clickbait views. Instead, you've went with the much better idea of boosting your own ego. That way, when people do show up to your streams for whatever reason, all they see is a man in his 40s talking himself in circles and trying to give himself the most amount of self fellatio possible. It's robust. I'm sorry, I got distracted. You were saying that you don't hate things for clickbait views? The further we go into Baldur's Gate 3 Endgame, the more I dislike this game. All right, and this is a game that I understand is something that attempted to do something probably never done in any kind of an RPG before. It tried to make an unmatched, insane amount of quantity while still maintaining a certain level of production value and quality in a retail gaming experience. You know, this is not a game that you paid $400 to play, although some people might very well say that's a justified price tag for the amount of content in the game. Okay. I'm sorry, I really enjoy Baldur's Gate 3, but if anybody's sitting here trying to justify a $400 price tag for Baldur's Gate 3 just because of the amount of content in it, you're out of your goddamn mind. You're regarded. That being said, shout out obviously, I'm really not surprised that the further the DSP got into the game that he wasn't enjoying it. Because from the very beginning, it was clear that he didn't enjoy the game. So I didn't think at any point he was just going to magically start enjoying the process that he vehemently hates. If you don't enjoy the first hour of getting a tattoo, you're definitely not going to enjoy the third or the fourth or the fifth. But unfortunately for us, DSP is going to wind up sitting through the entire game. Because where if you sit through an entire tattoo session that you didn't enjoy, you do get to walk away with a cool piece of art for the rest of your life. DSP gets to walk away with the fact that he didn't wage quit a game that all of the detractors said that he would. Because that means something to somebody somewhere, I think. At least in DSP's mind, which we all know is the only mind that matters. That flat ass skull and brain of his. But man, after yesterday's stream, the entire stream was like a comedy of errors. And as much as I'd like to admit that sometimes I'm the one making the mistakes, yesterday was just atrocious, okay? Simply using game mechanics that have worked the entirety of the game led to failure and disaster. Bugs, glitches, horrible design choices, frozen characters, screens teleporting back and forth between two rooms when I wasn't even in a room involved in something. Uh, it was just nonsense. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I didn't watch the gameplay. You guys should know by now. I am not a gameplay style viewer. I don't really know how anybody is. But DSP just makes me very skeptical that these bugs and glitches were actually occurring. Because he says that he was using game mechanics that have worked for the entire game. And from the gameplay sections that I have seen, DSP doesn't understand the mechanics of the game at all. Every time he needs to do something, he has to ask his chat if that's the right thing to do, if it works how he thinks it works, because he's incapable of reading comprehension. But I'm not going to be entirely unfair to DSP. I'll say about how Half of it was a skill issue and the other half was bugs and glitches. I think that's fair. So I'll just leave it up to either you guys or DSP himself if he ever watches this video on which half was which. And it all culminated at the very end of that session with me ultimately looking to lose a legendary weapon that is essential for the build of my character Karlak. And if it doesn't exist anymore, basically she's going to be nearly worthless. All right, because there's really no way to replace that weapon. 
Oh my God, he was robbed again? This game is absolutely ruthless. It must just be doing it for the endorphin rush. There's no reason to be constantly stealing from the guy, Larian. Come on. But I love how as soon as he loses the one weapon for Karlak, automatically Karlak is going to be useless. We couldn't do another build, you guys. We couldn't figure out something else to do with the character. We don't have any sort of backup loot that we could just switch over to and try a different build. Hell no. If we lost that piece of equipment, she's basically useless, guys. Write her off. Kill off her character. We don't care anymore. Demon Mommy's gotta go bye-bye. His lack of creativity and imagination when it comes to playing video games shouldn't be shocking to me at this point. But for some reason, it still is. I guess it'll just never be normal to me. I guess I just can't imagine being as narrow-minded when it comes to video games as DSP. Did I do something wrong to deserve that? No, it's just a wonky game engine. Okay, okay, hang on now, DSP. You've done a lot of things wrong to deserve a lot of things. I think losing a legendary weapon in a video game is honestly the least of your problems, considering the schemes and scams that you've pulled off throughout the years. Because while all of those schemes and scams might sound good to you, and they might sound good to me, honestly, the IRS may or may not be agreeing. And that's sad, because a game with this many moving parts, there's so much to keep track of. I can understand when every once in a while something goes wrong. In fact, I can understand if like every third of the time something random happens and you're not expecting it. But when you're in the end game and you have a situation where you've built a character over the course of 130 hours and everything you've done has worked towards this character's build and basically this character is so good, they've single-handedly been the reason you have won end game challenging boss fights like the Raphael fight. And then to say, oh, we just decided in this particular fight, there's going to be a random variable that's going to cause chaos, and now an item will literally be yeeted from existence. Finger snapped out of the game engine. It's completely unacceptable. First thing, DSP, please never say yeeted out of existence again. You're too old for that. Not that that's exactly a new term to be using, but you're too old. The second thing, how are you going to acknowledge that the game is allowed to have bugs because of how massive it is and how much content there is and how long that content goes on for? But the second a bug actually happens, you're going to be frustrated with it. I personally don't agree with any bugs, honestly. But no game is perfect, and I understand that. I just think it's insane to say that you understand that and you expect it, and then immediately afterwards say that you were pissed off about about it and it's unacceptable. You're the person who just accepted it, I thought. And this whole thing just sounds so similar to the Astarian situation that we just went through the other day. He lost all of the equipment when Astarian left, so he can't make another Gloomstalker build that he's been relying on like a crutch for the entire 120 hours of gameplay at that time. And now we're having the exact same discussion when it comes to Karlak and her build. This guy, man, he never changes. It really is the same shit every single day on loop. You know, last week I ranted about a character in my party leaving and taking all his equipment with him. Now you can argue that's the result of my choices in the game. Fair enough, I just don't like the way that he walks out of the game with no way to get those items back and no opportunity to even know that he's about to leave. I promise I didn't remember that he actually said that immediately afterwards. But even he acknowledges that it's a very similar situation with the equipment. And I do want to acknowledge very quickly because somebody in the comments actually called me out on this and this definitely wasn't the way that I intended for it to come across. I don't think adding in the ability to talk to Astarian when he's trying to leave the party to get some of your gear or your loot back is actually a bad idea at all. In fact, I think it's a really good idea and I think it really helps with the roleplay. I think it improves upon what they had going. I do understand why it's not in the game and DSP was arguing forward in bad faith simply because he was trying to fix his problem that he created by himself. But I wasn't trying to say that it was a bad idea, and if it came across that way, I apologize. I should have gave DSP the dues when he said it, because it was actually much more thought out than most of the drivel that comes out of DSP's mouth. So again, apologies. In this case, I didn't do anything wrong. It's just the game engine that's causing me strife, and it looks like at the very end of the game is going to screw me over, and now we've got to pull a last minute audible to figure out how to remedy the situation. In fact, it's so funny because literally right now, no one can concretely tell me what actually happened, nor is anyone sure if that spear actually exists or not in the game world. And to keep with the sentiment of my last interjection, the way that he lost his spear was a glitch and was not designed that way intentionally. So this really shouldn't be a problem that DSP has to deal with. If it's a glitch in the game, that is kind of unacceptable. With that being said though, shout out the spinoff, the solution to this really is as simple as the solution was for Astarian. Just reload and do it again. But this time, do it correctly. But just like with the Astarian situation, DSP would rather get on stream every single day, bitch moan and complain about something being wrong 
wrong in the game instead of just taking the time to fix it himself given the game mechanics that are in the game. Some of my favorite games have a lot of jank to them, but as long as there's simple solutions to fixing some of that jank or at least dealing with some of that jank, I really don't think that it's that big of a deal. And one of those solutions is very often just reloading a save. I understand that nobody wants to lose progress, but it's much better than wasting your audience's time bitching, moaning, and complaining like DSP does every day. A lot of people are under the impression it's gone and others are like, maybe it's hidden. So we got to try to figure this out as we play today. It's just a mess. And the fact is for a game that is supposed to be game of the year, for a game that's supposed to be adhering to a very strict rule set of D&D, it shouldn't be a variable of, we don't know what happened. It should be very distinct and easy to figure out what happened and it's not. And that's a problem, okay? I do hate this though, regardless of whether or not it's a glitch, it being a D&D based game has nothing to do with how difficult it is to actually program the game and make sure that everything is running smoothly like it's supposed to without any glitches. I don't know why he thinks that just because it's based off of a tabletop RPG all of a sudden that everything should be explainable and there should be no glitches in the game, even though he acknowledged just a few minutes ago that he understands that there's going to be glitches and even expects them. Also, he called out the game for winning game of the year and still having glitches. Newsflash for you DSP, every single game that's pretty much ever won game of the year, I promise had a glitch in it. Because pretty much every game has glitches and bugs. It's just how games used to be, currently are, and will continue to be. So, today, we are going to talk all about yesterday's disaster stream of Baldur's Gate 3, and how the comedy of errors built up to the ultimate fumble, and now what to do moving forward. Good news is, we're in the final hour. Right, it's in the we're we're running to the end zone. We're almost there. We're gonna finish this game in just a few days, and then finally we'll be done with it. We can say it enough. Cause I'll be honest, like I've enjoyed the game. There's no way I would have played a game for 130 plus hours if I wasn't overall enjoying myself. I want to make that clear. I asked for this in my Astarian video, and I honestly can't recall a single person who did it. Could anybody give me one thing that DSP actually enjoys about Baldur's Gate 3 and has expressly stated? Because I cannot think of a single thing. He hates every aspect of the game. But don't worry, you guys. I wouldn't have played 130 hours of the game if I wasn't overall enjoying it. Completely ignore the fact that there's one or two dents that are bankrolling this entire playthrough and managing to make this a profitable venture for DSP. Because that profitability has nothing to do with DSP's overall enjoyment. I promise but i also feel like this game basically got an insane amount of passes when other games would have been judged very harshly for the problems that this game has because there was this humongous hype behind it for whatever reason and i don't know because actually i'm not into dnd i'm not into larian studios games or this style of game so I actually don't know where the hype came from. Well, I can tell you, DSP, that a lot of the hype came from the simple fact that Larian Studios has a lot of trust in the community. They demonstrated, especially with Baldur's Gate 3, the fact that they listen to the community. They take their feedback into consideration and have been the entire time that they were designing Baldur's Gate 3. They gave people what they paid for, a good, high-quality game with a lot of content to boot. And they made that entire genre very accessible to a whole host of people who have never played a game like that before. And they gave those people a lot of reasons to try it out and play it and experiment because they wrote such good stories and characters that these people wanted to see and experience. Obviously, there's ways that Larian could have improved the game. There's definitely scenarios that they could have tweaked to make it better. But those are really small complaints in comparison to other games that are constantly coming out. Games where you're constantly fighting back against their DRM, against their microtransactions, against their battle passes, against their online only requirements, against the lack of content for a fully priced game. All right. I respect the game for a lot of the things it's trying to do, making essentially the longest retail game possible. I don't think I've ever played a video game before where I paid regular retail price and got this much content out of it, right? And it's not rehashed fetch quests. It's not go grind against a thousand goblins. It's all you need. That's a huge undertaking and a huge accomplishment in my opinion. Um, but FYI, I'm sorry. I do feel like this game is overhyped, is overpraised. It has these wonky problems, these jankiness to the game engine. The, the problem that it's just so complex. Again, it's so many moving parts that at some point you have to understand that when something goes wrong, it's just not fun anymore. 
so because the game is so complex according to dsp there's so many moving parts there's so many mechanics a simple bug will immediately make the game not fun anymore as opposed to simpler games where if a bug happens it's totally fine and nobody cares i'm not following that logic dsp that's not something that i can subscribe to also if he thinks that baldur's gate 3 has a jankiness to the engine i would hate to see him play some of the older pc games that i enjoy playing or hell even new pc games that i enjoy playing all my kenshi enjoyers know what's up dsp wouldn't last a second he get robbed for his food cube as soon as he hits start because the dust bandits no prey when they see it and that's the point i'm at like after yesterday i'm at my wits end with this game i just want it to end so we can say it's done i've done it move on and that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. He's not interested in seeing the game through so that he can actually experience the story and the characters. He just wants to say that he did it for whatever reason. Because sticking it to the detractors and trolls is far more important to DSP than making good content, having fun with a video game, or actually enjoying a story. And that's incredibly sad that he lets the detractors run his life this way. I have no idea why he lets that happen. But this is the same guy that said that he wasn't going to have any children in the future because of detractors. He actually said that he wasn't going to have any children because they would get harassed and bullied don't get me wrong another troll w obviously we don't need dsp breeding but it's sad nonetheless that he lets the detractors run his life this way and that's not good you shouldn't have that feeling when you've invested 130 hours into a game that one game of the year you shouldn't have a feeling of incredible exhaustion and just wanting to move on at the end of it and i do Again, it winning game of the year has nothing to do with how you feel about the game, DSP. It doesn't actually make a difference to anything or anyone. I think that you're giving the game of the year award too much prestige, even though you're the one who's constantly saying that it doesn't mean anything. And if you really feel this way about the game, don't continue to play it. Just quit playing it because games are supposed to be enjoyed, DSP. They're not supposed to be grinds that you just want to finish. And that's my honest take. And listen, I'm sure there's tons of people out there who don't have that feeling or never did during the course of playing the game. I can only share with you my thoughts from my personal experience. This game fell apart in the third act. It really did. Like, there's so many problems we've had in this third act, and this is just the icing on the cake now, that it's hard to recommend someone invest this much time into a game that at the end can ruin you because it decides to. You know what I mean? So anyway... Oh yeah, DSP, it ruins you because it decides to. Like, you didn't acknowledge that it was a glitch in the game and wasn't actually supposed to happen like that. Who knew that Larian Studios, Carlac, and Astarian are all secret detractors? They're gonna be on TBS next week, watch out. And again, as a non-gameplay watcher, the way that he describes Act 3 kind of sounds very similar to the way that he's described the entire game. So this doesn't sound out of the ordinary. This doesn't sound like Act 3 dropped the ball. It just kind of sounds like DSP is complaining more than normal a little bit or at least he's had very specific problems that he wanted to call out rather than complaining in general that's probably a more accurate way to put it let's talk about it all right let's go ahead and discuss the stream from yesterday just to get this out of the way here's the schedule for the week no 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 we're not doing schedule segment get that ass banned we're moving on and no we're actually not going to move into talking about Baldur's Gate 3 some more I know shocker there's so much left to talk about that'll be its own video for a different day this was kind of the warm-up the foreplay if you will instead I want to talk about somebody that's probably never experienced foreplay and that would be one minute man because for those of you who don't know one minute man missed a tip the other day and as I'm sure you could all imagine DSP space gaming stock absolutely plummeted when their largest contributor and supporter didn't show up for one single stream but of course he came back the next day and he had what i would consider a very ominous message i've kind of got my own i kind of have a theo theory about it and that's why i wanted to cover it ah! oh okay so hold on uh it's one minute man he tipped 10 bucks he has an update on the asterian situation i believe let's see what he has to say thank you for the 10 dollar tip one minute man is that the biggest tip of the day so far it is let's get him on the leaderboard of course, we have the longest manual leaderboard in history. Okay, so he says, I rewatched your segment from a few days back, the I Got Robbed segment where Asterian stole my stuff. He says, I wanted to find out why you didn't get an option for a happy ending and avoiding frustration. It turns out you locked yourself out of that conversation with Asterian like you did with Saravok in part 42 of the playthrough. Okay. 25 minutes, 46 seconds in, I chose option one. All right, what do you need? All right, expresses agreement in this context. When you went back on your word and you didn't help him, you pissed him off. 
if you had chosen option two, you can't finish the ritual, you'll kill all these people, you would have been given the opportunity to persuade Asterion. That would still be in your party. Nobody dies except Cazador, and all prisoners go free to live in the Underdark. Everyone in your party is proud of Asterion, a really happy and satisfying outcome. Wow. So for anybody who needed closure on how exactly DSP managed to screw himself and have Astarian leave his party, because there was a lot of people asking me exactly how he managed that one. There you go, One Minute Man did the research for all of us. I guess big ups One Minute Man. And of course, like always, it's DSP's fault, because he fails to have the basic reading comprehension skills required to play an RPG. So just think about that. Because of an arbitrary conversation choice that I made in part 42 of a 133 part playthrough, some, you know, 100 hours later, that choice is somehow remembered by the game engine and I'm screwed out of having a happy ending. What do you mean remembered by the game engine DSP? Technically, yes, but it was remembered by the character because it was something that you said to them. And in that context, DSP, you agreed to help Astarian. So yeah, I would imagine that he would be pissed off when you go back on your word and refuse to do the thing that you outright accepted to do. So you can sit here and say, oh, that was a hundred hours ago, which for most people, it wasn't a hundred hours ago. You just take ages to play a video game. And you can say that it's arbitrary all you want, but that's not what the reality is. The reality is it's your fault because you can't remember anything you take too long to play video games and you don't care about these characters this is not and has never been the game's fault it's entirely on your shoulders who would have even thought you know back then that i you're not understanding what you're saying or that it has any repercussions or what it means right right so yeah that's kind of i mean i'll be honest i think that's kind of silly that you're you're locking yourself out of content later for something you did early in the game okay does he think this way in real life too? Does he really think that it's silly that in real life, if you say the wrong things to the wrong person that you're locking yourself out of later content IRL? Yes, DSP, if you piss off your boss and spit in his face, you lock yourself out of having a job at that business for the rest of your life, way to go. That is how these things work. That's what a realistic situation would look like. When you tell people you're going to help them and you don't do that and you go back on your word, they're going to have a negative opinion of you. There will be repercussions. And sometimes those repercussions are now and sometimes Sometimes they're later, but just because you got off scot-free for now does not mean they won't come back to bite you in the ass. Sound good? Sounds good to me. And I want to remind you, the IRS might not be agreeing. Anyway, I received another $10 tip, of course, from One Minute Man. And he continues on with this. He says, In conclusion, the dialogue would allow for Asterion to actually have a very positive and satisfying character arc, which would make him a better and mature person. Your choice of dialogue brings out the worst in him, so you end up losing a useful companion, and worse, because he has the, your good stuff, which rightfully belongs to him, I disagree. He has been fighting alongside you, putting his life on the line. You expect him to leave butt naked? No, I think, like I said, there should be an option to hash it out. Either he keeps it all, you keep it all, or there's a compromise option, or you fight for it, as I explained last week when we went over that. And I already said my piece on that earlier. Again, I apologize. But even the super dent one minute man is on our side when it comes to the fact that DSP is expecting far too much out of a Starian to strip butt naked and just leave without any of the loot. Even though DSP claims that that's not what he wants, if it would have happened that way in the game, he wouldn't have had any quarrels with it. But listen very closely to the next segment of this clip because this is the part that I think makes it very ominous from one minute man. And this is where my Theo theory comes in. Shout out Theo does vids, obviously, big Theo fan. Um, if I were him, I would have left you nothing. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned. Be careful how you talk to people. Choose your words carefully. Uh, you may lose someone important to you in life. That's how it works. Yeah, that part right there. When he says, be careful how you talk to people and choose your words carefully. And then he goes on to say that you may lose somebody that's important to you. Given how DSP has been treating One Minute Man recently, especially since he's been writing all of these excruciatingly long messages about Baldur's Gate 3, a game he's very passionate for. I wonder if this is a hint hint that One Minute Man is on his way out. Like I said, this is entirely a Theo theory, but him not showing up for one stream, you know, the guy who shows up every single day like clockwork, and then following it up the next day by saying, be careful how you talk to people, you might be losing somebody important to you. I don't know, it just seems a little on the nose to me. Maybe like Sir Moist said, it's not that deep. But I always enjoy a little bit of theory crafting. So let me know what you guys think about the situation, if there's anything to be thought about it at all. And if you have any other theories, please let me know. I definitely want to read some theories in the comments. Fair enough. Maybe it's a life lesson, or maybe it's just a really annoying, arbitrary line early in the game that you have no idea of the repercussions of because of the way that they coded the game. But, well... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, One Minute Man. I appreciate that this morning. Okay.
And I'm glad that we could finish off this clip with an example of DSP just kind of shrugging off One Minute Man's message and again, treating him kind of like shit. And to make this already kind of strange video even stranger, this is going to be the ultra rare six star triple feature because there's one more clip that I want to take a look at and we have the time today. So this is a random discussion that DSP had just a couple of days ago out of the blue. And I personally thought it was a bit interesting. <laughs> Cypress TV says, this is completely out of left field, but in late 2015, why didn't you interact with chat during gameplay? What was the thought process then? Uh, for the first many years that I streamed, so we're talking, when I first started Direct Capture, it was in early 2013, and all the way through uh, late 2016, because it really was late 2016, early 2017 that I became an interactive streamer. It was actually the very beginning of my Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild playthrough that I decided I was going to be interactive, okay, and change my whole methodology of how I was going to make content. And just think about that for a second. Think about where streaming was when Breath of the Wild came out. Think about where you were and what you were doing in the content that you were watching. And then we have DSP, who is essentially streaming the same way that he would record a video. Not interacting with the chat, not engaging with them whatsoever, no feedback, no discussion, just him filling as much dead air as possible and making the worst jokes. Something about this happening during the Breath of the Wild playthrough really puts it into perspective for me because it doesn't seem like it was really all that long ago. Further proving just how far behind the curve he really is when it comes to content creation so when i did that um why it's this simple because i was an idiot the whole point of being a live streamer is that you have a live audience and if you don't take advantage of that live audience then you're kind of missing the point of having the live stream correct and i did 100 i missed the point of having the live stream i was streaming and ignoring the audience i acted like no one was watching live seriously <clears throat> and if you want to know why it's very simple. It's because of my origins. I didn't start as a live streamer. A lot of content creators today did. They started off streaming to an audience. I don't like the way that DSP says taking advantage of the live audience. I know what he means, you know, interact with them, get their feedback, engage with them in some sort of discussion, keep them engaged and have fun with it, obviously. But DSP is a scammer. I 100% believe there's some part of him that actually means taking advantage of the chat. And real quick, I wanna say that I don't think that when anybody starts streaming, they're immediately streaming to an audience. Most of the time they're streaming to zero people for quite a long time, which isn't exactly a very easy thing to do. Streaming to zero people feel strange and obvious awkward but go ahead dsp you couldn't interact with chat because you were used to making videos for me from the years of 2008 <clears throat> all right all the way through you know early 2013 so you're talking a good four to five year span of content on youtube i was just doing offline videos there was no interaction live at all there was no potential for live interaction the only interaction i had with my, my fan base was video comments tweets and forum posts and occasionally an email here or there, or like going to a convention and meeting some people in person, okay? That's how I had my interaction. There was no chat anywhere. So because of that, I didn't have an interactive element to my content. But that shouldn't matter, DSP. That shouldn't have made a difference what your past content was like. Because you were moving into a new form of content. And when moving into that new form of content, you should have realized all of the differences between the two and taken advantage of the things that you could have. Especially when it's a feature as big as chat, you know, one of the very cornerstones of a stream. If you're not interacting with chat, at least to some capacity, what is even the point of streaming? You're meaning to tell me that this guy was really sat there thinking that people just wanted to watch him make a video? That was what they wanted to see? I mean, inevitably, some of them did. That's why they stuck around for as long as they did or do, I guess. Is there anybody still hanging out from that era? But what an insane thought nonetheless. When I decided to go to Red Capture in early 2013, um, <clears throat> I did not understand the capacity for growth and the positivity of interactions with people on a stream. It is 100% my fault. I take full responsibility for the fact that I was ignorant. I literally said, hey guys, I'm streaming, but it's fan service. If you want to be there for the live stream, great. You can see the stuff live, but I'm still basically making this content for an on-demand audience. And that was reflected in the fact that I didn't do any contributions on the streams whatsoever. I didn't shout out anyone on the streams whatsoever. Like I said, I literally ignored the audience. If you go back and watch my playthroughs from 2013 all the way through 2017, I'm not talking to anyone. Really, there's nothing like that at all. It's just me playing a game as if I'm playing it offline. And a lot of people didn't understand that, and they definitely were correct in not understanding it. But he still kind of does that, doesn't he? He makes the content for the on-demand viewers. And I don't mean that he just uploads the videos in an on-demand format. I mean, he's very particular in when he does the shout-outs for contributions. He's very particular in that you can only talk about the game while playing the game because it wouldn't make any sense out of context during the VODs. The only real difference is the interactive hand-holding that he gets from the chat. Because that's about the only time he actually engages with the chat during gameplay. And that's only a slight difference from what he was doing in the past when he was just 
just reading guides. Now he's reading guides that are sometimes wrong and very vague, but at least they're there for nonstop assistance if needed. I, once I became an interactive streamer in 2017, the reason I did it is very, very simple. YouTube's apocalypse happened. And when YouTube had the apocalypse, it became impossible to make a living on ad revenue alone on YouTube, okay? I had to find alternate methods of, you know, profit. And everyone said, dude, you are streaming every day. Why on earth are you not interacting with your audience to become a monetized stream? Why don't you have cheer? Well, keep in mind at this point, I was still streaming on YouTube and I decided to go back to Twitch in late 2016 because of people urging me to do so. And they were like, why are you not accepting cheers? Why aren't you in the partner program so that you can have, you know, uh, subs? Like, what is your, are you stupid? Everyone literally is doing this and you're not. So DSP's foray into the interactive streaming era was based entirely around the money that he could be making by interacting with his chat. Of course, I don't think that there's anything wrong with making any sort of monetary gains when doing content creation online. But this is outright him saying that the reason he moved from one piece of content to the other is because the other was more monetizable and was going to make him more financial gains. There's just something greasy about saying it like that, whether it's true or not. Because usually when people talk about going into streaming or becoming a streamer, they talk about how they love to engage with their chat. They love their audience. They have a lot of fun interacting with them and having cool discussions and talking to people that they've never talked to before. But not DSP. He's only there to talk about being monetized and doing cheers and bits and how he would make so much more money being a full-time streamer. It's a way to get live support from your audience every single day and you just ignore the people who are there like they don't exist. I mean, you're an idiot. People were right. Now I know that because now that I, I've been an interactive streamer for so long, you know, now I've been doing it pretty much seven years. And now that I've seen the difference between making a video pretty much just for an on-demand audience, only, you know, trying to talk over every single moment of the game to kill the the, the noise or the, the, the emptiness, you know what I mean? Instead of having true meaningful conversation and interactions with <clears throat> the audience here, I just have to constantly make stupid jokes about sex and race and fart jokes and all kinds of shit, constant, right? Always constant nonsense what are you talking about you didn't have to talk about any of those things dsp you didn't have to say any of those jokes the reason you said those things is because you wanted to those were the things that were on your mind those were the jokes that you found funny those were the discussions that you wanted to have during the gameplay people who still do playthroughs to this day on youtube don't make those jokes because they're not those people they're not you thank god you could have transitioned into talking about any other thing during your videos if you really wanted to but that's not what was important to you what was important to you was monetizing your viewers as often as possible Possible. And the easiest way for you to do that was to do streaming full time. So, and you know, that's reflected now. Now that we're doing these retro reactions, we're going back and watching these old playthroughs. Half the time you laugh your ass off and half the time you're cringing at how bad the commentary is because I wasn't doing it for a live audience. I was just doing it to fill dead air constant for myself. It was so different, you know? And the thing is, it was just, I was set in my ways. I was set in my ways. I thought my shit didn't stink. I'm the one with the YouTube channel. I know what I'm doing. My way or the highway. If you don't like it, don't watch. That was the worst attitude to have. But it's an attitude that you maintain to this day, DSP. Don't act like you've changed. Every single suggestion box proves this. They call it the debunk box for a reason. You constantly shoot down every single suggestion that's given to you simply because it requires a little bit of effort on your behalf. And anybody who slightly disagrees with you is labeled a detractor and a troll and immediately banned. It should have been be open to criticism, be open to constructive criticism, not destructive criticism, because there's a lot of that these days, but there was a lot of constructive criticism back then that I completely overlooked because I just wanted to keep doing things, the status quo, exactly the same, not changing, you know? When I finally changed in 2017, my eyes were open because by the end of that year, I was like, I've had more fun this year streaming than I think I had had in like many years doing the on-demand style content before. It just blew my mind that there's so much more fun to be had with an interactive audience, you know? And I'm so happy that, that eventually I stopped being so stubborn and it was really you guys convinced me to be different and change. And once I did, like, wow, it saved the business. Single-handedly becoming from an on-demand style creator to a, an interactive streamer had changed and saved the business and allowed me to have the most fun I ever had as a content creator up to that point. But well, that sounds like a lot of meaningful and positive conclusions that came out of this, which makes it all the more astounding to me that you continuously refuse all of these suggestions that people are giving you that could improve your content. You'd think that you would have learned from this situation. You'd think that given all of the positives that happened, that you would continue to take these suggestions and run with them because these people have proven that they can help your content. And I'm like, dude, well, I kick myself every day. If in 2013, the moment I had adopted to live streaming, if I'd become an interactive streamer, things would have been different today. I fully believe that. Because I would have started talking to you guys, and you guys probably would have been like, listen, don't be so angry if this is how you don't play. 
This is just a silly thing that's going on. Ride the wave. Make your own. Laugh at it. React to it. React to this is how you don't place in 2013 and laugh at them and people won't think you're an asshole. I should have done that. One million percent, I should have done that. I really don't think that that would have helped this situation at all. Because regardless of what his personal reaction to this is how you don't plays was, his gameplay would have been the same and they would have came out exactly how they came out time after time. He still would have been a laughing stock of the gaming community simply because his gameplay is that abysmal. And inevitably, people would have found out how big of an asshole he really is. Because again, regardless of his interactions with this is how you don't play and his reception of them, he's still a piece of shit as a person. And that would have reared its ugly head eventually anyway. It's my fault. I take full responsibility for being a stubborn idiot and not seeing the trends and where they were going. I was such a dr dinosaur in that time that by the time that I adopted the interactive live streaming, already the entire internet thought I was a laughing stock and a meme. And once that was it, once that happens, it doesn't matter how much you change for the better and improve yourself as a person or a creator. These idiotic people who just believe memes will just believe them forever. It doesn't matter how much I change or how much better I am today than I was back then. There will be an endless amount of people on the internet who want to hate on me and laugh at me because they just believe the bullshit. And that's my fault to some extent because I took so long to change my, you know, I should have done it so much earlier. You're right, DSP. You should have done it so much earlier. And it's absolutely 100% your fault. There's no one else to blame for your reception on the internet other than you. You can blame the detractors all you want, but all of the detractors are just watching your footage. Your footage is the problem. But it is nice to hear him take some sort of responsibility for his actions in the past. So big ups for that, I guess. But speaking of actions in the past, some of you guys took action and left comments on my last video. So I'm going to take a look at some of those. Paul Turner. 4684 says Phil is once again throwing all of his eggs into one basket he has no plan b he thinks the future is talking to his camera all day and people are going to pay him to do that anything that disrupts Phil's fantasy is deemed immediately hostile and will be dismissed lest Phil have to deal with the ever-growing problem of his financial insolvency DSP really is the king of throwing all of his eggs in one basket he never has a backup plan he never has an exit strategy well I guess I can't say that because trolling 39 says that his exit strategy is hiding in the bathroom and crying I'm an alcoholic and that has been proven effective in his past. So maybe that's his deus ex machina. When it comes down to it, in the final hour, this will be his exit strategy and it will get him out of all of life's issues. And Willis Moore, 156 says, he repeats everything, thinking people might not have seen it, but when asked about something and he needs to repeat it, he gets upset. Which one is it? It's whatever DSP wants when he wants it, dude. It's his world and we're just living in it, unfortunately. It's just another example of DSP not being consistent in flip-flopping on everything in his entire life. Hopefully that answers your question but even if it doesn't, I want to give a big shout out to everybody who watched the video, especially if you made it this far. Hopefully I catch all of you guys in the next video, but until then, make sure you check out other detractor content and dive deeper into that. Snortex.